السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Page number two seventy-eight. الحمد لله رب العالمين. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد باب يبدأ الكبير بالكلام والسؤال عن رافع بن خديج وسهل بن أبي حثمة رضي الله عنهما أن عبد الله بن سهل ومحيصة بن مسعود رضي الله عنهما أتيا خيبر فتفرقا في النخل فقتل عبد الله بن سهل فجاء عبد الرحمن بن سهل وحويصة ومحيصة ابن مسعود إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فتكلموا في أمر صاحبهم فبدأ عبد الرحمن وكان أصغر القوم فقال له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كبر الكبرى قال يحيى لي للكلام الأكبر فتكلموا في أمر صاحبهم This chapter is about Elder should speak or should be allowed to speak before the youngsters In the previous chapters Imam Bukhari rahimahullah mentioned some ahadith about respecting elders and olders. Elder in any way that is an elder, maybe younger in age, but he's an elder to us. Or someone who is older according to the age has to be respected also. Here Imam Bukhari rahimahullah in this chapter is mentioning one of the ways of respecting the older people around us. And that is, when there is someone that is older than you in age, and you need to talk about something, always allow the older person to speak first. Of course, sometime when it comes to talk, youngsters can't hold it. And they want to say it. In fact, in these days, most of the time, youngsters feel these older people don't even know what they're talking about. So I need to speak because I have the right understanding. When children or parents are there, for children, their parents are elder and older. So of course, children have every responsibility to make sure that they do not cut their parents when they are speaking, they do not stop them from talking, and if parents are talking, they should listen to them very quietly and without any interference. Never indicate to them that you don't want to listen to them. This is an amazing fact of our life when children are young and we all know children are children we all went through that stage of our life they like to keep on talking and talk about simplest thing and something that has no value no sense but they keep on repeating and repeating and they just want to talk about it and at a very young age the child would just like to talk about his own personal things. Doesn't care about what parents are going through, what they want. They want to hear him or not, they have to hear him. That see how big I am now. Now, throughout the day, he just wants to prove how big he is. Or how big she is. And, Dad, look at this. And they're drawing something that really means nothing to us. Parents are busy. But it's still for the sake of their children. They say, okay, they may be tired, very busy, have a lot of things to do. They have a lot of things on their mind. But, okay, yes, that's very beautiful. How did you draw it? Can you draw another one for me? And they keep on doing these things. And parents having so much with their, to keep that, their connection, their love 
an affection to the child. Because of that, they keep on encouraging the child and they keep on paying attention to the child, keep on smiling with the child and taking their time off from the busiest schedule and spending it with the child. And then, as the child grows up. Now, it comes to the age where this child is young person, man or woman, and parents now getting into, the, into their old age. Now, father or mother says something twice, the child is annoyed. If parents will end up saying it the third time, the child will just, will blow up. And how many times do I have to tell you? That I told you yesterday too. They lose it totally. Parents may have, you may have told the same thing to your parents when you were young, hundred times. And they didn't shout at you like this. And here two times, you can't take it the third time and you shout at your parents. So anyway, it's very important, these adab are very important. And not just with parents and children, with everyone that is older than us. People that are older in age, we should respect people according to their age. In this hadith, Rafa ibn Khadij and Sahil ibn Abi Hathamah radiyallahu anhuma, they both narrate the hadith. That Abdullah ibn Sahil and Muhayyasah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhuma, they both went to Khaybar. Let me tell you briefly the story of this hadith so that we can understand the translation easily. Two of the young Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in. One was Abdullah ibn Sahal and the other was Muhayyasah ibn Mas'ud. These two young Sahaba, they went to Khaybar after Khaybar was conquered. So Khaybar, if you remember what Khaybar, Khaybar was the center where all the Yahud used to live. Even the Jews that were kicked out of Medina Munawwara, they went and lived, started living in Khaybar. Many of them moved to Khaybar and some moved to Syria. So, Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een had their land in Khaybar, their farms, because half of Khaybar was to be given to Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, or in fact, the Khaybar, Khaybar, the whole Khaybar belonged to the Muslims after, after that time. So, Sahaba had the land over there. So, occasionally they used to go and see the land and see how things are working over there. So, these two young Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Sahal and Muhayyas ibn Mas'ud, they went to Khaybar to look for some of their staff. Over there, some people, residents of that area, saw these two young people are walking the streets in the night time. They got an opportunity and they killed one of them. And this wasn't the only occasion. There were other occasions also when some Sahaba went to Khaybar and they were killed. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was also tortured and harassed over there. In fact, he had some knee problem because someone threw him from the top of the house and he broke his leg. After that, he, he wasn't able to pray uh, sitting in the Qa'da properly. So here, Abdullah ibn Sahal was killed. Mahayyas ibn Mas'ud ran away. When he came to Medina Munawwara, he went and he explained to his brothers and his relatives everything that had happened. So then, his brother, whose name was Huayyisa, and Abdul Rahman, Abdullah ibn Sahal's brother, Abdul Rahman ibn Sahal, they all said, decided to go to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and tell him of what had happened. So they went to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, Abdul Rahman's brother is the one who's been killed, and. Muhayyisa was with uh, Abdullah at that time. And his brother just went to support. His, his brother, whose name was Huayyisa, went to support his brother Muhayyisa. When they went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you could imagine the situation and how emotional Abdul Rahman is that they killed my brother. So as soon as they got over there, they said, we need to talk to you, Rasulullah. Okay, what do you want? And right there, Abdul Rahman ibn Sahil, the brother of Abdullah who was killed, he started talking, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, he told me that my, 
Rasulullah wait, wait, wait. He was the youngest out of all three. He said, Kabbir al kubr Let the older person speak. And then you can talk when your turn comes. So he stayed quiet then. He stopped and then Muhayyisa explained the whole situation. And then of course, Abdul Rahman talked and whatever he, and he said whatever he had to say. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them that can you have 50 people that can take oath that you know who killed this person, who killed this, his brother? I said, no, Ya Rasulullah. How about you people take 50 oath? Can you? I said, no, Ya Rasulullah. We haven't seen ourselves. The killing itself, we haven't seen it. We know people attacked him. And that was only one of them there. All three were not there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in this case, if you are making a claim that there were people from that neighborhood, you don't know exactly who the person was. People from that neighborhood who attacked Abdullah ibn Sahal and they killed him. You know that for sure. They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, we know this much for sure that it was Muhayyis of witnesses that people came from their houses over there. So it was people from the neighborhood that came and attacked us. So I ran away and they got him and they killed him. But I didn't see the killing itself. Later on, I saw that he was killed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in this case, the rule of the sharia is, we will approach those people, the people of that neighborhood, and we will ask them that have 50 people from your area who would take oath that مَا قَتَلْنَاهُ وَلَا عَلِمْنَا لَهُ قَاتِلًا We never killed him and we don't even know if anyone from our area did anything like this. We don't know who killed him. If they would take 50 oath like this, 50 people will take oath, then they don't have to pay anything for it. They are not responsible for it. But if they refuse, then because it was in their neighborhood and there is a witness that people from the neighborhood attacked, then they will have to pay the ransom. We can't kill no one for it because we don't know exactly who the person was. See, the rule of the Sharia being very clear at every point and considerate to every one's situation. So if they don't take the oath, which means they know who killed them, then they have to pay the ransom of 100 camels. But no one will be killed on his behalf because we don't know exactly who the killer was. They said, Ya Rasulullah, people who killed, they can take false oath too. We don't trust those people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that's the rule of the sharia. I can't change it. When they accepted it, they said, okay, if that's the rule, that's the rule. What, what else can we do? Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, okay, let's do this. No sense of fighting with those people, going to them and creating another situation. And they will say, you know, you guys are just blaming us for nothing. Here, I will give you people 100 camels from my own. I will pay you 100 camels. And he gave them 100 camels. So, this is basically the story of the hadith. And the reason Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, have narrated this is to tell us about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is stopping the younger one from speaking when there were older people around him. And he said, first thing, let the older people speak and then you will have your turn to speak. And here now, let's compare two things. One is, when there is something to eat, to drink, to pass on, then whoever is the older person sitting there, the elder in the, in the gathering, he will pass it on from the right hand side. Say for example, someone gives us a drink. We pass it on from the right hand side. And everyone, people on the right hand side will get it first. Even if there are older people sitting on the left hand side, still people on the right hand side will get it first. This is about food, drink, anything that, I thought something that you pass out for people to use. But if it is about talking, then older people will have the right to speak first. Regardless of where they are sitting in the gathering. That's one rule that we learn from this hadith. Another important thing that I like to point out in the light of this hadith, that there was a treaty between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Yahud. They were not supposed to do anything. They were not supposed to kill, especially that's too much, you know, even attack anyone. They were supposed to protect anyone that would go to Khaybar from the Sahaba Radwanullahi alayhi wa sallam. But when this happened, you could see that 
this would really create a situation for Sahaba to be very angry. All the Sahaba would be very angry. Every naturally, every person would be angry. Now we should go and tell these people that you have to leave Khaybar right now. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not only that, he didn't even approach them. He didn't even talk to them. He paid the hundred camels of his own. This tells us how Prophet ﷺ used to solve these type of situations. These situations are not to be solved with emotions. We need to teach them a lesson. We need to tell them this. We need to do this. Always cool down. And solve situations in the best way, being the humblest way possible. Because the more you go into these things, the more you are creating fitness and opening the doors of fitna. Especially when you don't have anything solid in your hand. Now, Prophet ﷺ, if he would approach those people, that, you know, this person was killed in your neighborhood and for sure he's someone from the neighborhood and here there is another person who witnesses for that also. And right there they will say, are you blaming us? And you people just keep on blaming us for things. We don't even know what will happen. If it, if it was in our area, our neighborhood, what fault is ours? I mean, we, have, we haven't done anything wrong. Is, and you just create a situation. Prophet ﷺ wanted to cool everyone down. Now, he knew that if I would just cool them down by telling them, by explaining this to them, this is the time when they're emotional. They're very emotional this time. You tell them, cool down, they won't listen. Okay, I'll give you. You need 100 camels. That's all you will get. 100 camels from them, I'll give you 100 camels. So these people now will cool down. What a beautiful way of solving this type of situation. It's not easy. And then when you're paying 100 camels from your own pocket, why would I pay? But to solve the situation of the ummah. Look at the larger scale of benefit for the ummah, that what is the best way of dealing with this type of situation. It's not just this situation at this time and my emotions, it's at the whole picture of what could be the consequences of this, what could be the result of it, and overall, how we want to deal with these situations. So, let's now quickly go through the translation of the hadith. Abdullah ibn Sahal al Muhayyis ibn Mas'ud went to Khaybar. فَتَفَرَّقَ فِي النَّخْلِ They went out in different areas in the, in the farms over there. Abdullah ibn Sahal was killed. Abdul Rahman ibn Sahal and Huwayyisa and Muhayyisa, the sons of Mas'ud, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they explained the situation of their friend. Abdul Rahman started, he was the youngest. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, let the older person speak. So they then talked to Prophet ﷺ about their friend who was killed, Abdullah. So Prophet ﷺ said, أَتَسْتَحِقُّونَ قَتِيلَكُمْ أَوْ قَالَ صَاحِبَكُمْ بِإِيمَانِ خَمْسِينَ مِنْكُمْ Can you have 50 people who uh, take oath and then you can be paid as a, uh, the ransom of it by those people? They said, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't see it. So we can't do that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَتُبْرِئُكُمْ يَهُودُ بِأَيْمَانِ خَمْسِينَ مِنْهُمْ Then Jews can be free from this blame by 50 people taking oath of them. They said, Ya Rasulullah, قَوْمٌ كُفَّارٌ They are kuffar, so they won't care about oath. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَوَادَهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam مِنْ قِبَلِهِ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paid them the hundred camels on his behalf. Sahal رضي الله عنه says, فَأَدْرَكْتُ نَاقَةً مِّن تِلْكَ الْإِبْلِ فَدَخَلْتُ مِرْبَدًا لَهُمْ فَرَقَطَتْنِي بِرِيلِهَا One of those camels once, I was just over there around the camel and the camel kicked me. So he just explained the situation, one of the stories, his stories with those camels. Next chapter, بَابٌ إِذَا لَمْ يَتَكَلَّمِ الْكَبِيرُ هَلْ لِلْأَصْغَرِ أَنْ يَتَكَلَّمْ Now we learned that the younger people should allow the older people to speak. But, if the older person doesn't speak, then what? Does the young person, younger person has to stay quiet and never speak? What should he do? This hadith will tell us that. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَخْبِرُونِي بِشَيْرَةٍ مَثَلُهَا مَثَلُ الْمُسْلِمِ تُؤْتِئُكُ لَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا 
لا تحط ورقها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم once asked رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, the Sahaba Ridwan Allah and we mind this quiz and this was Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's habit sometime he used to ask them questions also just to make them think about these Islamic issues so he said tell me about a tree that is like a Muslim keeps on giving the fruit at all time and the leaves of these trees do not fall Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu says فَوَقْعَ النَّاسُ فَوَقْعَ فِي نَفْسِي النَّخْلَ I thought, it came to my mind that it's the palm tree. But Sahaba Ridwan Allah and Ajma'in were thinking about all kind of trees that were out in the jungle. فَكَرِهْتُ وَنَا تَكَلَّمْ I didn't want to speak. وَثَمَّ أَبُو بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرْ There is Abu Bakr and Umar there, which means my... Older people are there and my elders are there, so I didn't feel like saying anything. I just stayed quiet. When they didn't say anything, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He and Nakhla, that's the palm tree. When we left, I was going back home with my father. I said, Dad, I knew that it was the date palm tree. But I didn't want to speak at that time. He said, I wish you would have said it and I would have been so proud of you and that would have been more happier than me than getting the whole world. So he said, yeah, dad, but when I saw that you and Abu Bakr, you didn't speak, so I didn't speak. So now what is it that we learn from this hadith? One is, the main thing that Imam Bukhari mentioned this hadith for, and that is, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu didn't speak. What does that mean now? Of course, he thought it's best for him not to speak as part of the other, and respect. But his dad told him, you should have. You should have spoken up. So if we didn't speak, doesn't mean you can't speak. This tells us if the youngsters, if the older don't speak, then youngsters can speak. This is only in a situation when the older ones want to speak, then the younger ones should allow the older one to speak first. But if the older are not saying anything, then youngsters, they don't have to stay quiet. They can, they can say and they can, they can speak. They're allowed to speak in that situation. The second thing here that we learn in this hadith, Prophet ﷺ's different method of teaching Sahaba. See, he used here quizzes. So this is... a a way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used for teaching Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam. Number three, a very important thing that we learn from this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a mu'min is just like the date tree, the palm tree, which is, he said, keeps on giving the fruit and the leaves don't keep on falling down. If anyone have seen that tree, you know it, that leaves don't fall of that tree. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us this is how a mu'min should be. That doesn't throw dirt around him. Doesn't make surroundings dirty. Some of the trees, throughout the winter, you have, as soon as the summer is out and fall, you have to keep on cleaning the yard. And you're so tired of everything, next summer, this uh, coming summer, I'm going to cut this tree out. Every summer you think I'm going to cut it, but you never do it. But you get, it gets you tired, you know, how much you have to clean. If there was a palm tree in your yard, you don't have to do any cleaning over there because of that tree, number one. Number two, the only thing that would fall of that tree would be dates, something that you can benefit from. So whatever comes from the tree is beneficial. No dirt, doesn't make things dirty. Prophet ﷺ wanted Muslim to be like this. That doesn't make his surroundings dirty. Which means, a mu'min is not a person that will start bringing haram to his surroundings, bringing evils to his surrounding, bringing fitna to his surrounding. People around him don't see evil, evil and fitna from him. It's not that he's introducing sin. Okay, today I listened to a new song here. They, they can, you want me to give you, when you have your iPod with you, I can transfer it to your iPod. And then everyone is listening to the song. Everyone is listening to the music because of this person. Or... The person is sitting there and he starts backbiting. 
Now they are in the haram. They are backbiting. He is spoiling his frowning. The thing that is falling from this person is all dirt and najasa. He is spoiling his frowning. So, a mu'min is not like this. A mu'min, whatever he gives, it will be dates. It keeps on giving fruit. It keeps on giving sweet fruit to the people in the surrounding. Next chapter is Babu Tasweed al Akabir. That when there is an older person, then we should try to make that person to be the Amir, to be the leader. Hakim ibn Qais ibn Asim narrates that his father Qais ibn Asim radiyallahu anhu, who was a Sahabi, at the time of his death as well advised his children saying, Ittaqullah, which means he's telling them, listen, now I'm leaving the world. These are the last days of my life. So one thing I want to tell you, you should always fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is the advice of every person to his followers, his students. Every teacher would advise his students at the time when they're departing, he will say, Ittaqullah. Make sure that you people always fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every scholar of Islam that we see wrote his will. He starts his will, his will with Ittaqullah. Telling everyone who would read his will that make sure you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said, Qais ibn Asim radiallahu anhu, well known sahabi, he said, Sawwidu akbarakum. He's telling his children that make sure after I leave, after I depart this world, you choose the oldest amongst you to be your leader. Amongst the brothers, the oldest brother should be the leader. Young ones should not fight with him that, you know, dad is gone now and I am more, more wealthy and I'm more educated and I'm this position and that position. No, older brother is always on the highest command. You make sure that he is, stays there mere. فَإِنَّ الْقَوْمَ إِذَا سَوَّدُوا أَكْبَرَهُمْ خَلَّفُوا أَبَاهُمْ, خلفوا أباهم. When people choose the older one to be their Amir, then they are really being the successors of their father. Which means, then you are continuing with your father's work. Your father was there, now the older brother is in the place of your father. And, وَإِذَا سَوَّدُوا أَصْغَرَهُمْ أَزْرَى بِهِمْ ذَلِكَ فِي أَكْفَائِهِمْ And when they start choosing, when they choose the younger ones, the youngest brother, to be their Amir amongst the other brothers, then that puts them down amongst their contemporaries, which means people around them and people that are of the same level. Uh, they look down at them, look, these are, his, their older brother is so dumb that he doesn't know anything. So they had to make the younger one their leader. وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمَالِ وَإِسْتُنَعِي Then he says to his children that make sure you take care of your wealth. Keep some, I mean, don't give up the wealth totally. وَإِسْتُنَعِي And earn the wealth also. He's saying that keep your wealth, take care of it, and earn your wealth also. Try to have some good amount of wealth. Why? فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ بَهَةٌ لِلْكَرِيمِ because when you are wealthy, then it, wealth protects the decent people. That people don't start insulting you, thinking, you know, who is he? Uh, they start looking down at you. Because when they consider you being a poor person in this society, then everyone looks down at you. So he said, you know, keep, stay in a good situation with wealth, so that people don't look down at you. When you stagna bihi anil naim. And at the same time, so that you protect yourself from the mean people, that you don't run after mean people to help you at the time of need. And always refrain from asking people. Don't ask people for anything. Regardless of what your need is, refrain from begging people. Don't beg. فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ آخِرِ كَسْبِ الرَّجُلِ this is the last thing a person want to use for earning, begging people and asking people for his needs. When 
Once I die, do not well over me. Because when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, no one welled over Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nawha means when they cry out loudly for the dead person. When, of course, you hear about someone's death, you feel like you want to shout to get everything out. But that is not the way. Yes, tears will come out. You control yourself. Don't use your tongue. He was this, he was this, he was this. He was so great and he was so important. No, don't use your tongue. Control your tongue. That's one thing. Number two, don't raise your voice in crying. You feel like crying? Tears will keep on coming. That is out of control. When Rasulullah wasallam's son, Ibrahim, passed away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was hearing him there in his laps. And the tears are falling of his eyes. He's crying. Tears are falling. And he says, Al-Qalbu yahzan. That heart are very sorrow. And eyes are dropping and shedding tears. Wala naqulu illa ma yurdi rabbana. But we will only see, say what will please our Rabb. We won't say anything that will displease Allah. We only say what will please our Rabb. We are grieving on missing you for missing you and you are you leaving us, O Ibrahim. We grieve on you. But we, I don't say, Prophet said, but I don't say anything more than this. I think I mentioned it when I graduated and it was the last session of our hadith uh, with our teachers over there the, in the books of hadith. It was the last dars of hadith. So the teacher said the same thing looking at me. He says, now you people are graduating. وَإِنَّ عَلَىٰ فِرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ لَمَحْزُونُونَ So he said, this is the rule of the sharia. That you don't raise your voice intentionally to cry. Yes, if it comes, it comes. But you don't raise your voice uh, for crying and for telling people uh, at the time of crying that, you know, this is how I am, which I miss and things like this. وَإِذَا مِتُّ In fact, let me just tell you, when Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu was with Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at that time, when he saw Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa crying, he said, Ya Rasulullah, wa iyyak, you're crying too? Wa anta? You're crying? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, yes, this is the love for children. We, we, we cry, we do cry. But we don't say anything that is not allowed in the sharia. وَإِذَا مَتْتُ فَتْفِنُونِي بِأَرْضٍ لَا تَشْعُرْ بِدَفْنِي بَكْرُ بْنُ وَائِلْ فَإِنِّي كُنْتُ غَافِلْهُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ Then he says to his children, that once I die, that make sure you bury me at a place where generally people won't know where I'm buried. People won't, can't find the traces of my grave because in the days of Jahiliya, before Islam, I used to, I, I read it the tribe of Bani Bakr bin Wa'il and at a time when they never expected it. So I read it those people, my fear is they would try to, because for those out of them who are not Muslims, they would try to come and dig my grave out to take revenge for the people that were killed. But of course it was in the days of Jahiliya. Next chapter is, بَابٌ يُعْطِ الثَّمَرَةَ أَصْغَرُ مَنْ حَضَرَ مِنَ الْوِلْدَانِ that if the fruit comes, something new comes, give it to the youngest person in the gathering. We learn up to now that young ones should respect the elders. When the elders are there, they should not speak until they allow the elders to speak. If the elders are not speaking, then they can speak. But here Rasulullah is telling us something now different and that is the older people should also take care of the young ones around them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's habit was, whenever any of the sahaba presented the first fruit from the farm, from the garden, someone opened the store, he ran and he brought the first 
merchandise, he gave it to Prophet maybe fruit, he gave it to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will make dua for that person, for this fruit, and then he would give it to the youngest person that is sitting there, that is in that gathering. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِذَا أُتِيَ بِالزَّهُمْ When Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was brought, uh, and whenever he was brought the first fruit of the season, Zahu means the first fruit of the season, Sahaba used to bring it to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, this is the first time that I'm getting these trees for this summer, uh, for these dates for this summer. Ya Allah, I got this banana for this summer, I got the watermelon for this summer. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would take some of it and then he would give it to the younger, youngest person sitting over there. He used to make dua first. Allahumma barik lana fi Madinatina. Ya Allah, give us barakah in our Medina. Wa muddina. And give us barakah in our uh, measurements. Which means whatever methods of measurement we are using, put a lot of barakah in it. So a person buys one kilo. It's enough rather than using it up in one day, it's enough for him for one month. And really that dua of Prophet ﷺ is being experienced until now in Medina. وَصَاعِنَا بَرَكَةً مَعَ بَرَكَةً Ya Allah, add more barakah with the barakah that you already gave us. So he's, every time is asking Allah to add more and more barakah in Medina Munawwara, in all the growth that is in Medina Munawwara. And really, that is a place of barakah, full of barakah. I think I mentioned it before also a couple of times, that when we were there, we never noticed, but after moving out of there, you buy a bag of rice. A few weeks later, in the list, they will tell you another bag of rice. But I brought a bag of rice only a few weeks ago. Yeah, it's finished. A few weeks ago, and later, another bag of rice. What happened? We are buying rice after rice after rice. Every few weeks we are buying a bag of rice. And now we start thinking, really, this is serious. We start thinking about it. When we were over there, we used to buy rice and these type of things once a year. But never noticed that it lasts for the whole year. And over there you have so many guests. Every week for sure you have guests. And sometimes you have guests that stay for a month, two months, three months, continuously they stay with you. This is the barakah of that place. You have, you have to accommodate that. So, but still with all of that, one bag of rice of 50 pounds once a year. Never thought about it that it's lasting more than it's supposed to until we moved out and now you're buying it every few weeks, you're buying a bag of rice, then you think, subhanAllah, what happened to all of that barakah? It's gone. So the place has the barakah of the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thumma walahu aswara min yalihi min al-wildan. Then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pass out that fruit to the youngest one that is sitting over there. Babu rahmat is saghir Next chapter is about having mercy on the youngsters. And this hadith, we studied it last week also. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ minna مَنْ لَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرُنَا وَيَعْرِفْ حَقَّ كَبِيرِنَا A person who does not have mercy on, on youngsters. And a one who does not recognize the right of the elders is not one of us. Which means Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that recognizing the rights of elders and having for elders to have mercy on youngsters is part of our deen. This is should this should be there. The next chapter tells us one of the ways how Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to deal with children. An Ya'la ibn Murra annahu qal Ya'la ibn Murra radiyallahu anhu says خرجنا مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ودعينا إلى طعام. We were invited to food. We were invited to someone's place for lunch or dinner. So we went out with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. فإذا حسين حسين يلعب في الطريق. Hussein رضي الله عنه was seen playing on the street. فأسرع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمام القوم. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he rushed and he went in front of everyone. And this is very important to notice now. See for us, when I want to pretend to be sheikh and imam and a scholar, so okay, even if I see my own son, I won't even smile to him. Because if you smile, people will see you smiling, then you do, they, lose, they lose your respect. 
But this is not what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was. He really, the thing you see in his life, he wasn't pretending anything. He was whatever he was. And he knew who he was. He was simple. He was very clear. He was outside of the house, whatever he was inside the house. He's very simple. So he sees his grandson, Hussein radiallahu anhu, playing on the street. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went in front of everyone, passed all the sahaba, he went fast. And thumma basata yadayi. And he spread his hands out. That come, 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 come. And فَجَعَلَ الْغُلَامُ يَفِرُّهَا هُنَا وَهَا هُنَا And the boy is running here and there and Prophet ﷺ is running after him. وَيُضَاحِكُهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Prophet ﷺ was laughing, laughing with the boy. The boy is running and he's laughing and Prophet ﷺ is running after him and he's laughing. Until Prophet ﷺ grabbed the boy. And the boy puts one hand in the beard of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He holds Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's beard. With the second hand, he holds the hair of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is how Hussein Al-Dhanu held Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With the beard and with his hand, with his hair. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hugged him. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Hussein is from me and I'm from Hussein. Allah loves the one who loves Hussein. Hussein will be a whole clan and he will be a full ummah. Which means, this was an indication that really at that time people did not us, but it was an indication that Hassan radiallahu anhu's family and progeny will not continue. But Hussein radiallahu anhu's will continue. And now, all the people that are considered to be from the children of uh, Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima radiallahu anha, they are the children of Hussein radiallahu anhu. That's the only lineage that continues and goes back all the way to that time. So here we see how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to entertain the children, play with children, even in front of people, he's playing with his grandson. Next chapter is Qublatul Rajuli al Jariyat al Sagira. Kissing a young girl. Makhrama bin Bukair narrates on the authority of his book, uh, father Bukair who says he saw Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu yuqabbilu Zainab bint Umar ibn Abi Salama he saw Abdullah ibn Ja'far who was kissing Zainab the daughter of Umar bin Abi Salama and she was only two years old so she was this is a young girl Imam Bukhari rahimahullah is telling us through this hadith that if there is a young girl don't think now this is girl this is very young, two years, three, four years old. Yes, as they grow up, then it's different. But she's very young. So, Abdullah ibn Jafar was kissing her, which means if she's, you have that young children you play with, and normally, you know, you play with those type of children, you kiss those children, young children, it's fine. As out of being like a parent, being like an elder to those. And Hassan al استطعت إن استطعت ألا تنظر إلى شعر أحد من أهلك إلا أن يكون أهلك أو صبية ففعل. Imam Bukhari with that narrated the second hadith to balance it to tell us we need to draw a line somewhere. Hassan رحمه الله used to advise people that if make sure that if you can do this that don't look at the hair of any woman. Don't look at the hair of any woman except your wife and young girls, then make sure you do it. Which means even the girls that are grown up, then don't look at their hair. So it's a way of our uh, life modesty, haya, part of creating haya in everyone, in the youngsters and the elders. That the younger ones, they're taught that they cover their hair. You see, mashallah, alhamdulillah, this thing continues in the ummah, that young girls, they mashallah wear a scarf. So they cover their hair. And this is Hassan al-Busri rahimahullah's advice, that try not to look at the hair of any girl, even if it is your own daughter, other than the young ones and your own wife. Try not to look at the hair of others, even if it is your sister. See, one thing is, unfortunately, we are getting into the trend in our society of halal and haram. No, it's halal. This is not uh, satr. And then, using that, 
a person is trying to keep everything uncovered that is other than farad. So the only parts of the body that is farad to cover will be covered and other, that, other than that it's all open. But that's not a good way. It's always modesty and haya is always should be there and is always good. And this is what Hassan al-Busri rahimahullah is advising that even in front of brothers and in front of uh, uh, other people that are mahram, a woman should try to keep herself covered properly. Because although they will not think about it that way, but still it comes to the mind, you know, my wife, my, my sister is better looking than my own wife. And sometimes you hear that type of statement that should I marry my sister to him? That, you know, my, my, my sister is better looking than his own sisters. So a person thinks that direction at some point. So it's always best to keep the shaitan out and not allow any thought of shaitan coming between. Qabil and Habil, the story is well known. Qabil wanted to marry his own sister. This is the son of the Prophet of Allah, Adam alayhi salam. But Qabil says, I want to marry my own sister. And in, we know in this culture, unfortunately, there are so many people that not only sister, unfortunately, you hear this all the time. People are unfortunately having uh, this type of relationship with their own daughters. So, shaitan is always there. We have to protect ourselves. Babu Sabi. Another way of showing your love to the children is putting your hand on the head of the child. Abdullah ibn Salam, Yusuf ibn Abdullah ibn Salam says, Sammani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the one who named me. And then, Waqadani ala hijri. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he grabbed me and he kept me, he held me in his laps. And وَمَسَحَ ala رَأْسِي And he put his hand on my head. So this is a way how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to show his love for the children. That okay, grab the child, make the child sit on his laps and then put his hand on the child's head. Aisha radiallahu anha says, كنت ألعب بالبنات عند النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وكان لي صواحب يلعبن معي I used to play with dolls in the house of Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم after marriage after I got married I used to play with dolls in the house of Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم she used to make them out of cotton and she used to play with them she says I had some of my friends they used to come and play, play with me also in the house فكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل ينقمعنا منه. When Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would come, they used to just go away. They used to shy away from him, hide when he would come. فيسربهن إلي فيلعبن معي. He used to send them back to me that go ahead, you guys keep on playing. So he sent them. He used to send them back to me, and then we used to play. Still, we will continue playing even after Rasul الله صلى الله عليه وسلم in the house is doing his own work. This shows that how Prophet ﷺ used to take care of the young ones that, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha, she feels like playing. It's not like, after I come home, then make sure that you leave everything and just keep on walking behind me. Which is the normal instructions now. That the instruction to the wife is, when I'm in the house, then just forget about the whole world. Don't talk to no one, don't play with anyone, don't even do anything else, just keep on being around me. Babu Qawli Rajul Lissagiri Ya Bunay. Next chapter is another way of showing your love to the young ones. That when you deal with the young ones, younger ones, you say to you, you tell them, son, use the word son for them. There is nothing wrong in using the word son for other children that you are showing them your love and uh, affection. Abu, Abu Ajlan al Muharibi says, Kuntu fi Jayshi ibn Zubayr. This is a story, which means the gist of the story is that one of the people from, from the Tabi'een whose name was Abu Ajlan al Muharibi, he says, I was in the army of Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. 
during that time, one of my cousins passed away and he made a will that give my camel fi sabirillah. My cousin, one of my cousins died and he made a will to me that give my camel fi sabirillah. So I had another cousin over there. He said to me, look, I'm in the army. I'm with you people. And I'm fi sabirillah. So therefore I want you to give me the camel because I really need it. So he said, I don't know until I ask a scholar. So they went to Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. They asked him the whole thing, they explained the whole situation to him and asked him the question that should I give my camel to him, my cousin's camel to him because he's saying, he's saying that he's uh, helping Abdullah ibn Zubayr. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said to me, Ya Bunayya, inna sabirullahi kulla amalin salih. Oh my son, all good deeds are fi sabirillah. So here are two things that he's telling him. One is using the word Ya Bunayya, O oh my son. Number two, he's telling us a rule that every good deed is Fi Sabirillah. Sometimes we like to keep Fi Sabirillah very precise to just our thing that because what I'm doing is Fi Sabirillah, everything else is Sabir Shaitan. But every work of deen is Fi Sabirillah. This is what we're doing is Fi Sabirillah. People are cleaning the masjid is Fi Sabirillah. Every work that people are doing in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah, he said that is peace of Allah. But now he says to him about that specific situation, فَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ قَوْمًا مُسْلِمِينَ يَغْزُونَ قَوْمًا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ If you find some Muslims that are in jihad, then maybe give those people this camel would be the highest level of peace of Allah. Because that will be the highest level. But as far as giving it to this person, I don't really recommend it because they, him and his friends are helping Abdullah ibn Zubair not because they want to do something fi sabirillah, it's only because they want him to have the power. So their intention may be, no, I don't think their intention is fi sabirillah, their intention is only about power. I don't, I don't really consider that they are doing it fi sabirillah, so don't give it to him. This is of course telling us that when a person is asked a question about Sharia, he has to be straightforward. Whatever you think is right, this is what the fatwa you would give. Next hadith is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man la yarham in nas, la yarhamuhullahu azza wa jal. A person who does not have mercy on others, Allah will not have mercy on him. In the next hadith, Jabir radiallahu anhu says, سمعت عمر رضي الله عنه أنه قال من لا يرحم لا يرحم A person who does not have mercy on others Allah will not have mercy on him ولا يغفر من لا يغفر A person who does not forgive others Allah will not forgive him ولا يعفى عمن لم يعفى And a person who does not pardon others Allah will not pardon that person وَلَا يُوَقَّ مَنْ لَا يَتَوَقَّ A person who does not protect himself, Allah will not protect him. In this hadith, we learn that having mercy on people is one of the very important things that we should have, a quality that we should have, that always have mercy on others. It's not that don't just look at your emotions. No, I need to do it. I need to hurt, do this. So he, I, we need to hurt him now. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the opportunity. Forgive. A person who does not forgive others will not be forgiven. But of course this doesn't mean if a person really continues hurting you, you have to forgive him. But if a person stops, he comes apologizes. Bismillah. What's wrong in forgiving? What are you going to get by not forgiving the person? If a person apologizes to you, let him go. But if a person you see sincerity over there, if you find that this person, he's apologizing to you as part of his plot, then you can tell him, brother, I'm sorry. I don't forgive. So, but generally the rule is, if a person is really sincere and he's asking you for forgiveness, you should forgive that person. And a person who does not protect himself, a person, sometimes people ask the question, you know, if it is not 
decreed for me to die, then even if I'm, jump, I'm gonna jump off the building, I will not die. If, Allah, if you don't protect yourself, Allah will not protect you. So the rule is, you need to protect yourself, Allah gave you that responsibility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us these beautiful qualities of deen, give us rahmah and shafaqah, give us adab and respect for elders. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfir to have clean and pure heart. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين